This presentation is going to introduce you to new features of Oracle Database 12C, which make it possible to use the Oracle Database in conjunction with schemaless application development. It will focus on a set of new APIs, which are delivered as part of Oracle Database 12C, and allow developers who have adopted schemaless application development to utilize the Oracle Database as their document store. We will also look at other new features of the Oracle Database that enable the storing, indexing, and querying of JSON documents. Let's review our agenda. We're going to start off by briefly discussing the features and functionality that today's application developers are looking for. Next, we'll take a look at how Oracle Database 12C can meet these needs. We'll introduce a new abstract framework included with Oracle Database 12C called Simple Oracle Document Access or SODA and review the functionality that it defines. We'll then take a quick look at two implementations of SODA. The first, called SODA for Java, provides an implementation of the SODA functionality that can be consumed by Java programmers. The second, called SODA for REST, is designed for use by programmers who develop applications based on representational state transfer or REST techniques. We'll also examine how Oracle Database 12C enables powerful SQL-based reporting and analytical operations on JSON documents without sacrificing any of the benefits of schemaless application development. Finally, we'll go over a summary of the benefits of adopting Oracle Database 12C as your JSON document store. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's quickly review the concepts behind schemaless development. The biggest change between schemaless development and traditional application development is that we store our application data as documents rather than as rows and columns in tables. Instead of defining an entity relationship model that describes all the data we need our application to manage and then mapping that model to a set of relational tables, we simply store the application data as a set of documents. Typically, the data in these documents is represented using extensible markup language, XML, or more recently, JavaScript object notation, JSON. Once we've decided to store our data as documents, we find that the primary access method for the data can often be satisfied using a simple key value pair. When the application wants to retrieve, update, or delete a document, it simply requests the document using its unique ID or key. The actual value of the ID is not important, so it can typically be a machine-generated GUID or similar. The big advantage of schemaless application development when compared to traditional relational application development is that with schemaless development, the database is agnostic to the structure of the data being managed. Instead of requiring a detailed knowledge of every data element used by the application, the database simply understands that it manages a set of documents. It does not need any knowledge of the structure or content of the documents it manages. This means the application data model is no longer baked into the storage schema. This allows application developers to change the application data model on the fly. They can make changes as needed and put the updated application into production as soon as they have completed the necessary testing, since there's no need to make changes to the storage schema in order to accommodate the changes to the application. Once the decision has been made to adopt schemaless application development and persist the application data as JSON documents, there is a tendency to gravitate towards using a NoSQL style document store to manage the JSON content. The characteristics of a typical NoSQL document store include 1. It is very simple and easy for an application developer to download and install. 2. The developer does not need support from a dedicated DBA while developing the application. And 3. They provide limited support for indexing and querying JSON documents. Document stores typically provide simple document-centric APIs that can be learnt very quickly. These APIs do not provide anything like the full power of an RDBMS API like JDBC, but they do make it easy to perform all of the basic tasks associated with application development. They also map very nicely to the REST approach to application development, which has become very popular with a large number of today's application developers. Unfortunately, the use of a document store provides a number of challenges for most organizations. First, it is almost impossible to perform any kind of meaningful reporting or analytics on data managed by a document store. While most document stores do provide some kind of limited query by example or QBE capability that can support the needs of the application developer, the typical document store simply does not provide a standardized formal query language like SQL that can support users who need to perform ad hoc queries, reporting or analytics. Also, none of the commonly used business intelligence and reporting tools that users rely on understand how to access content stored as JSON in a NoSQL document store. In order to enable query and reporting and analytics on data tied up in a document store, it will be necessary to export the data in question from the document store, subject it to a set of complex, expensive and error-prone ETL operations, and finally load it into some other kind of database where standard reporting tools can access it. 
Also, most of the NoSQL document stores have extremely limited support for basic application development table stakes features like index back joins, locking, concurrency control, and read consistency. It also appears that many of today's application developers do not fully understand or appreciate the power and importance of these features, since Oracle and the other RDBMS vendors stopped discussing these capabilities a long time ago, as it was taken for granted that all the products in the marketplace supported them to a greater or lesser extent, and everybody knew about them and understood their value. Most of the document store databases do not support these features, and their answer on how to address this lack of functionality is really quite simple. We provide flexibility by leaving that to the application developer. These products then try to position this lack of functionality as a benefit of the document store. Personally, I'm not sure I get that. Oracle has invested many hundreds of man years in providing a platform where all of these features can be taken for granted. So why is it such an advantage to go back 20 or 30 years and solve these problems from scratch all over again? They are hard problems to solve and trying to ignore them or somehow say they are somebody else's problem is simply not an acceptable approach for an enterprise grade platform. Some NoSQL document stores may provide limited support for in-memory joins between the data stored in a single document, but none of them have the ability to support joins across documents or across collections, yet alone joining data in JSON documents with other kinds of data that your organization has to manage. Now let's talk about Oracle as a NoSQL document store. Oracle has been building features into the database to support application developers for well over 20 years. Back in the mid-80s, the Oracle database was not just about data management and executing queries. The database already included many features that were designed to make it things easier for application developers. If you think about the early releases of Oracle, in particular Oracle releases 6, 7 and 8, then the database already included features like store procedures and triggers, referential integrity, distributed transactions, advanced queuing, lobs and support for spatial data. These features were all added to make life easier for application developers and ensure that application developers did not have to code that kind of functionality for themselves. In the late 90s and early 2000s, we took our eyes off the needs of the application developer. We just assumed that it was a given. Oracle was the database of choice for application development. We had been so successful that the size and number of Oracle databases an organization had to manage had grown so quickly that our customers were demanding that we switch our focus to scalability and manageability. We worked to ensure that the Oracle database could be successfully deployed in the data center, that it could handle very large volumes of data and extremely high numbers of concurrent users. At the same time, we introduced products like Enterprise Manager to ensure that the IT department could successfully deploy and manage very large numbers of Oracle databases across the enterprise. Recently, we have focused our efforts on meeting the needs of the application developer once again. We are building features into the database that ensure that Oracle Database 12C is the best platform to support your application development. This effort includes building new drivers and interfaces that support modern application programming and scripting languages such as R and Node.js. We're open sourcing these drivers where appropriate so people can understand how they work and how to best make use of them and where necessary contribute to their development. We've introduced support for pattern matching, XML and JSON, and have new tools that make it easy to develop and deploy REST-based services that interact with data stored in an Oracle database. In terms of schemaless development, Oracle has been deeply involved with the underlying technologies almost from the very beginning. Oracle first got involved in helping develop XML-based standards back in the late 90s. We were members of the working groups that developed XML standards like DOM and XSL, as well as XML Schema. With the first release of Oracle 9i, we were the first major vendor to support storing XML in the database, and this release also included support for working with XML content using C, Java, and PL SQL implementations of common XML-based standards such as DOM, SAX, and XSL. With the introduction of Oracle 9i release 2, we were the first major vendor to offer optimized storage and processing of XML documents. We didn't just allow you to store XML in the database, we allowed you to process the XML, and we understood that processing XML data was different to processing relational data. Oracle Database 10G Release 2 maintained our commitment to the XML standards process. We became the first major vendor to support the WC3 XQuery recommendation. We ensured that the database understood and could optimize XQuery just as effectively as it can understand and optimize SQL. Our early support for XML focused on structured XML documents documents which conform to an XML schema and which easily mapped into the object relational extensions that were originally delivered as part of Oracle Release 8. As the use of XML became more widespread, we began to see people take advantage of the flexibility offered by XML and we started to see greater use of semi-structured and unstructured XML. We quickly realized that our original object relational storage model, which works very well for highly structured XML, 
could not keep pace with the kind of use cases we were seeing. In order to ensure that we could support these emerging use cases, Oracle 11G introduced new binary XML storage and indexing techniques, allowing the database to handle non-schema-based XML, as well as semi-structured and unstructured XML, just as effectively as it can handle highly structured XML. During this period, the XML standards continued to evolve, and the XQuery standard was extended to include support for XQuery update and XQuery full text. XQuery update provides a language for updating XML content, while XQuery full text provides extensions to the XQuery specification that enable full text searching of XML content at the document, fragment, element, and attribute level. Once again, with the release of Oracle Database 12C, Oracle was the first major vendor to support these extensions. During this time, we began to see the rise of JSON as an alternative to XML for document-based persistence. Some people regard XML as too complex and verbose, and the XML standards as difficult to understand and learn. And the simple nature of JSON provides them with an easy way to get the benefits of document-based storage without having to learn and understand all the relevant XML-based standards. When we looked at JSON, we quickly realized that it was in fact a much more simple way of representing hierarchical data. And we also realized that all the lessons we learned from developing our XML support could easily be applied to the problems of storing, indexing, and querying JSON. So starting with Oracle Database 12, patch set 121020, we have added support for JSON to the Oracle Database. What we set out to do with Oracle Database 12C was to enable the next generation of application developers to continue to leverage Oracle as their data management platform. In order to meet this objective, we realized that we needed to allow the database to store and manage JSON documents, and that it also had to provide the developer with a NoSQL style development experience that has become so popular with today's application developers. This meant that the database needed to provide a simple document-centric API that allows a developer to store and manage JSON using an Oracle database in exactly the same way they would store and manage JSON in a NoSQL database. A query by example capability that allows searches on JSON documents without the need for the developers to learn SQL. The ability to perform other common operations such as creating and dropping collections and indexing without having to learn SQL or involve a database administrator. However, in our world, NoSQL means not only SQL. We provide full support for the NoSQL development paradigm, but should you need it, should you want to perform reporting and analytical operations on your data, you still have the full power of SQL available to you. You don't need to move all of your data out of your NoSQL document store in order to perform reporting and analytical operations on it. So let's talk about how we did this. The first thing we did was we sat down and asked ourselves, as well as a few industry analysts, what are the top three things that the next generation of application developers really like about NoSQL developers? Obviously, the first thing was, they're not constrained by a fixed database schema. A second was, the APIs they need to learn in order to develop their applications are really simple. And the third thing was, they don't need to learn SQL. So then we asked ourselves, what does this really mean? And we came to the conclusion that what they want is a NoSQL style API that makes it really easy to perform the basic tasks associated with managing documents and which can be used without needing to become a SQL expert. And that was the guiding principle for the design of the simple Oracle Document Access or SODA framework. SODA provides a simple NoSQL style API for working with documents stored in an Oracle database. SODA makes Oracle as easy to use as any of the NoSQL document stores. It allows you to work with JSON documents stored in an Oracle database without ever having to write a single line of SQL. You can create and drop collections, store and retrieve your documents, index your documents without ever once having to contact the database administrator. This was the primary objective behind SODA, to provide that kind of ease of use and development experience while still allowing the developer to work with the Oracle database. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that SODA could support all of the traditional application development platforms that we see, as well as all of the next generation scripting languages. SODA itself was designed from the ground up as an abstract specification that can be implemented in any of these environments. So let's look at the basic functionality provided by the SODA specification. First, we have collection management. With NoSQL document stores, we store and organize our documents into one or more collections. So we need the functionality to create and drop a collection. Typically, a collection contains a set of related information, much as a table does in a relational system. So we would have a collection for purchase orders or a collection for user profiles. Secondly, we need to perform CRUD operations on documents. CRUD stands for Create, Retrieve, Update and Delete, allowing you to store your documents, retrieve them, update them and delete them. Thirdly, we need list operations on our collections. 
the ability to list the set of documents in a given collection. We need to be able to search a collection for the documents that match a particular set of search criteria. In a NoSQL world, searching is typically performed using a query by example mechanism, where an application supplies the document store with a template document containing a set of search criteria and the document store returns the matching documents. Soda provides this level of functionality. Finally, we have a series of utility control functions. In the first release of Soda, this includes mechanisms to create and drop indexes, as well as a bulk insert facility. So that's the Soda specification in a nutshell. The initial implementation of Soda is Soda for Java, an API designed for use by Java developers. Also available is Soda for REST, which makes Soda available to a set of services that can be consumed by application developers who have adopted the representational state transfer or REST-based programming model. Soda for REST is released as part of Oracle REST Data Services, ORDS, release 3.0, which can now be downloaded from the Oracle Technology Network. We are considering Soda implementations for other environments and programming languages. Top of the list at the moment is an implementation for Node.js, followed closely by implementations for use with C and Microsoft C Sharp. One advantage of Soda for REST is it makes the Soda functionality available to any programming language or scripting environment that is capable of making an HTTP request. That said, we are also considering providing native integration with popular scripting environments where appropriate. Oracle does not force you to use Soda to access JSON documents managed by an Oracle database. As this chart shows, you can still continue to use all of your favorite SQL-based APIs to access JSON content should you choose to do so. Alternatively, you can make use of Soda for REST to access JSON content stored in an Oracle Database 12C document store from any environment that supports HTTP connectivity. Let's take a quick look at Soda for Java. Soda for Java provides Soda functionality for Java developers. It's a very simple set of five or six classes that make all of the Soda functionality available to the Java developer. These classes provide Java developers with the ability to establish a connection to the document store, to create and drop collections, to perform CRUD operations on documents, to perform list and query by example operations on collections, as well as indexing and bulk insert capabilities. No knowledge of SQL is required in order to make use of Soda for Java. When comparing Soda for Java with traditional relational interfaces like JDBC, you can see how much easier it is for a developer who simply wants document store functionality to learn and use Soda for Java. The Soda model is simple and intuitive, and Soda for Java means developers who know Java and want to store and retrieve JSON documents in an Oracle database can be up and running with Soda for Java in a matter of minutes. It really is that simple. This slide shows a simple program written in Soda for Java. The program establishes a connection to the document store, creates a collection, inserts a document into the collection, and returns the key of the newly inserted document. This is done by instantiating the Oracle RDBMS client class and calling its getDatabase method. The getDatabase method takes one argument, which is a JDBC connection object. And this is the only time that a developer using Soda for Java needs to directly interact with JDBC. Using a JDBC connection object to establish a connection to the document store has a number of benefits, including first, Soda for Java uses SQL Net connection to talk to the database, just like any other Oracle client software. It can take full advantage of both thin and OCI8 based connections. Using a JDBC connection also gives you access to the transaction control mechanism provided by the JDBC connection. Finally, sharing a JDBC connection means that you can have an application that contains a mixture of Soda for Java calls and conventional JDBC calls, and they can share the same connection and transaction semantics. Once we have established a connection to the document store, we are finished with JDBC. The get database class returns an instance of the Oracle database class which is the entry point for all of the functionality provided by Soda for Java. To create a collection, we instantiate a database administration object using the getDatabaseAdmin method provided by the Oracle database object. We can then invoke the createCollection method on the database administration object to create a new collection. We pass in the name of the collection we want to create, and we have the option of providing a collection properties document to override the default properties of the newly created collection. This gives us control over things like what metadata is maintained for the collection, what indexes are created, and what algorithms are used for key assignment and version control. The Create Collection returns an instance of the Oracle Collection object. Once the collection has been created, we can use the Create Document from String method provided by the Oracle Database object to create an Oracle document from a JSON. The Oracle Database object provides a number of methods that allow instances of Oracle document to be created 
from a number of different data sources. We use the Oracle Collection Objects Insert and Get method to insert the Oracle document into the collection. This method returns the resulting Oracle document object to the calling program. The Oracle document instance returned by this method includes methods that provide access to the metadata that was generated as a result of inserting the document into the collection. In this particular example, we are then going to invoke the get key method on the Oracle document object that was returned by the call to insert and get to access the key that was assigned to this document by the document store. As you can see from this simple example, Soda for Java is very easy to use. As we said, Soda for Java uses a JDBC connection and SQLNet to talk to the database that manages the Oracle document store. Developers can use the functionality provided by the JDBC connection to control their transaction semantics should they wish to do so. This allows a series of Soda for Java operations to be executed as a single logical transaction. It also allows a mixture of Soda for Java operations and regular JDBC operations to take place on the same database connection, which are very useful to ensure data integrity when working in hybrid environments where it's necessary to perform operations on JSON documents and operations on relational other kinds of data in a single logical transaction. Now we will introduce Soda for REST. Soda for REST is a RESTful API for working with JSON documents stored in the Oracle Document Store. It provides a set of services that can be evoked according to the principles of REST. The services support all the standard functionalities defined by Soda, including creating and dropping collections, performing CRUD operations on documents, list and search operations on collections, indexing collections, and bulk load operations. REST, or representational state transfer, is a very popular application development paradigm. It is based on the HTTP protocol and the concept of performing actions or verbs on resources identified by URLs. In Soda for REST, we model the documents and collections within a document store as a set of resources in a simple three-level hierarchy. An easy way to think of this is that the document store for a particular schema is represented by a folder. Each collection within that schema is represented by a subfolder, and each document within the collection is represented by the file. The names of the subfolders are derived from the names of the collections, and the names of the files are derived from the unique IDs of the documents. Each object managed by the document store is associated with its own unique URL. Operations on the document store are performed using the HTTP protocol, and the verbs defined by the HTTP standard. Since Soda for REST is based on HTTP, it can be used from any programming language or scripting language that is capable of making HTTP calls. This allows us to provide a set of services that provide access to JSON documents stored in the Oracle Document Store that are accessible and shareable amongst many different applications. Soda for REST is implemented as the Java servlet. It uses Soda for Java under the covers to interact with the Oracle Document Store. It can run in any container supported by Oracle REST Data Services 3.0. Soda for REST can also be run directly under the database's native HTTP server. Looking at the architecture for a moment, we have Oracle REST Data Services running inside your favorite Java container. It could be Oracle Web Logic Server or any of the other containers supported by ORG 3.0. ORG has been deployed into the Java container, and as part of that deployment, the Soda for REST server has been made available. When an HTTP operation takes place on a URL that has been mapped to the Soda for REST servlet, the servlet translates the verb and URL into operations on the underlying document store. It uses the URL to determine the collection and document that had to be accessed, and then it performs the necessary operations on the document using the appropriate methods provided by Soda for Java. One of the key design goals for Soda for REST was that you should never need to perform any processing of the JSON documents that form the payload to the HTTP operations. It should be able to stream the JSON content directly from an HTTP request into the database and stream JSON documents directly out of the database into an HTTP response. This allows JSON for REST to have a very thin, lean memory footprint, ensuring that it will scale to large numbers of concurrent users. RESTful services are a very well understood model. CRUD operations on documents are mapped to HTTP verbs, POST for insert, GET for retrieve, PUT for update, and DELETE for delete. Other operations, such as query by example, indexing and bulk load, are mapped to overloads on a POST operation. The JSON document forms the payload or body of the HTTP request and or response. One other thing to remember with REST, like all HTTP-based systems, is that it is stateless in a REST-based system. There is no concept of a transaction that spans multiple HTTP requests. Everything that happens as a result of one HTTP request is a single atomic transaction, and whatever happens on the next request is a totally separate transaction in its own right. 
Let's look at the services provided by Sode of Arrest. Assuming we've installed the Sode of Arrest server under the virtual pass slash DB Soda, here are some of the services provided by the Sode of Arrest servlet. A get operation on the URL slash DB Soda slash schema name will return a list of all the collections in a particular Oracle document store. A get operation on slash DB Soda slash schema name slash collection name will return a list of all the documents in the specified collection. A get operation on slash DB Soda slash schema name slash collection name slash document ID will return the contents of the document associated with the specified ID. A put operation on slash DB Soda schema name collection name will either get a no op if the collection already exists or if the collection does not yet exist, it will be created. A put operation on slash DB Soda schema name collection name slash document ID will update the content of the document associated with the specified ID. A post operation on slash DB Soda slash schema name slash collection name will create a document from the contents of the request body and return a response document that provides the ID assigned by the document store. A post operation on slash DB Soda schema name collection name action equals query will cause a query by example based search against a specified collection. The query by example document is provided as the body of the HTTP request and the response will consist of a list of documents that match the criteria specified by the QBE document. Here's an example of using the insert document service provided as part of Soda for REST. We insert a document into a collection by performing a post operation on the URL that is mapped to the collection object. We set the content type for the request to application slash JSON and we provide the document to be inserted as the body of the post request. The response to the successful post consists of a JSON document that provides the metadata associated with the newly created document. This includes things like the ID assigned to the document, an e-tag that can be used to check whether or not the content of the document has changed, as well as the creation and last updated timestamps. The beauty of this approach is that it doesn't matter what environment is being used to perform the operation. Any programming language or scripting environment that can perform an HTTP operation can invoke the insert document service. I do not need any knowledge of SQL or any understanding of the Oracle database in order to be able to store my JSON documents in the Oracle document store. Here's an example of using the query by example service. We invoke the query by example service by performing a post operation on the URL that is mapped to the collection and appending the parameter action equals query to the URL. We set the content type for the request to application slash JSON and we use the body of the post request to supply the QBE specification as a JSON document. Soda for REST invokes the search capabilities of Soda for Java and the QBE is translated into a SQL expression that makes use of the new JSON exists operator to perform a search on the JSON content stored in the collection. The response to the request is a JSON document containing the metadata associated with the matching documents. Again, despite the fact that SQL was used to execute the query that located the documents that match the QBE specification, the application developer needed no knowledge of SQL in order to be able to make use of the QBE service. Now let's take a quick look at a real-world example of using Soda for REST. In this example, we're going to use JavaScript to invoke some of the services provided by Soda for REST to perform operations on the Oracle Document Store. In order to invoke a web service from a JavaScript program, you need to understand the XML HTTP request object. This object, implemented by all JavaScript engines, allows JavaScript programmers to perform HTTP operations against a remote server. In the early days of the World Wide Web, any time a change needed to be made to the data shown on an HTML page, the client had to make a request to the server, and the server had to send a completely new page back to the client. This was incredibly inefficient, especially if the changes that needed to be made to the page were small. The introduction of the XML HTTP request object enabled small incremental changes to be made to an HTML page in a very efficient manner by allowing JavaScript running in the browser to make HTTP requests to the server without having to refresh the entire page. HTTP requests made using the XML HTTP request object are normally asynchronous. This prevents the JavaScript engine from blocking on the request, allowing the browser or any other environment to remain responsive and be capable of performing other tasks while it's waiting for the request to be serviced. It does mean that at first glance, the code that makes use of the XML HTTP request object looks a little strange when compared to the normal linear control flow associated with synchronous programming operations. Let's have a look at how easy this is to use. Here's a simple JavaScript function to process a GET request. It takes two parameters. The first is the target URL for the GET operation, and the second is a callback function that should be invoked once the response to the HTTP operation is available for processing. The first thing the function does is instantiate a new instance of the XML HTTP request object. It then invokes the open method 
specifying that the object will be used to perform a get operation against a supplied URL. The third parameter of the open method indicates that the operation will be asynchronous. Next we define the onReadyStateChange function. The onReadyStateChange function forms the basis of the asynchronous processing of an HTTP request using the XML HTTP request object. The HTTP requests go through four stages, and typically we are only concerned with the fourth state, which occurs when the response is ready for processing. The onReadyStateChange function is invoked whenever the request state changes, and once the ready state is set to four, we can continue execution of our application code by invoking our callback function, since the response is now ready for processing. In this case, the callback expects to be passed two parameters. The first is the XML HTTP request object. This gives the callback function access to the response to the HTTP operation. The second parameter is the URL that was used with this operation. For some reason, it's not possible to get this information from the XML HTTP request object itself. So the general rule of thumb here is that any application logic that relies on the response to the HTTP operation being available must be invoked from the callback. Once the onReadyStateChange function has been defined, we invoke the HTTP operation by calling the send method of the XML HTTP request object. Note that since we are taking advantage of asynchronous programming, once the send method has been executed, the function is complete and control of flow terminates. Control of flow for this task will resume once the callback function is invoked when the XML HTTP request state changes. We've seen how Oracle Database 12C can be used as a JSON document store and how the Soda family of APIs provides a kind of simple NoSQL style application development that is becoming so popular with today's application developers. So far we have seen that Oracle Database can provide the application developer with exactly the same kind of functioning and developing experience as a NoSQL style document store. Now let's look at the real benefit of choosing Oracle as your document store, the fact that you still have the full power of SQL available for reporting and analytics. Today it is not uncommon to hear application developers making statements like, I must use a NoSQL document store to support my application because it gives me the flexibility I need to deliver my application on time and under budget. Or, only a NoSQL document store will allow me to develop and deploy my application without having to worry about what the impact on the organization is every time I need to change my schema. I think we have already shown that it is now quite reasonable to counter these statements with Oracle Database 12C gives you all of that and more. That's no reason to abandon Oracle. However, the real benefit of using Oracle is that Oracle gives you all of that plus all the benefits of SQL-based reporting and analytics. If you don't want to learn SQL and don't need SQL to develop your application, well, that's fine. But sooner or later, somebody in the organization is going to ask some questions about this data that were not programmed into the application. If we use a NoSQL document store to manage the data, then we'll have no choice but to unload our entire database into some other product in order to answer those questions. Whereas if we use Oracle, we cannot use SQL to answer these questions without needing to perform any data migration. I actually know of a real use case from a few years ago at a major online retailer where most of the information captured by the order entry system was stored as compressed XML blobs in the style of a NoSQL document store as a key value pair. One day, the CEO of the organization asked a fairly basic question that could only be answered by looking inside each of these objects. The entire three terabytes of zipped data had to be unzipped and converted into a conventional relational data set before the question could be answered. If that data had been stored as XML or JSON using an Oracle database, the application developers would still have had the flexibility they required to develop the system, and the CEO's question could easily have been answered using a simple SQL query. The point I'm making here is that we never know how we're going to want to use the data our applications capture. These things do happen. Sooner or later, somebody will urgently need the answer to a question that was not considered when the application was developed. And at that point, we need a platform that can supply those answers in a timely manner. Consequently, we need to continue to use a platform that can support the needs of the application developer and that can provide powerful ad hoc reporting and analytical capabilities on the data captured by the application. By storing our data as JSON in Oracle, we get all the benefits of schemaless development and a NoSQL document store, plus the ability to continue to use the proven power of SQL for analytics and reporting. So let's see how this works. This is the other part of the story. By storing the JSON in Oracle, you retain the ability to have powerful ad hoc reporting and analytical capabilities on top of your data. JSON content can be accessed from SQL using new SQL operators. These operators are part of the forthcoming SQL JSON standard and the syntax and underlying theory has been developed in conjunction with IBM and has been accepted by the SQL standards process. These new operators include JSON value, JSON query, JSON table, and JSON exists, 
as well as the new condition called XJSON. These operators are very similar to the operators that are introduced to support XML, which is not surprising when you think about it. First, the problem that is being solved is very similar. How do you navigate and query a hierarchical data structure? And the second, not surprisingly, is the teams that designed and developed the XML support in SQL were also responsible for adding the JSON support to SQL. However, we have learned a few things from the School of Hard Knocks while building the XML support. So not everything is identical, but fundamentally the ideas are very similar and should be familiar to anyone who has used our XML support. For JSON, we have a set of JSON operators that use JSON path expressions to navigate and query JSON objects. What we don't have is a full-blown language, similar to XQuery, that can be used as a query and programming language in its own right. JSON path expressions are restricted to a much simpler set of operations, which makes sense. JSON documents are in general much simpler than XML documents. Keeping JSON path expressions simple means that they are much easier and more efficient to evaluate than XQuery expressions, so that in many cases, a JSON path expression can be evaluated using a single streaming path through the JSON document. The statement on this slide shows the use of the JSON table operator and a set of JSON path expressions to expose values from within a JSON document as columns accessible via SQL. The details of JSON table will be discussed later. One thing we learned was keep it simple. In order to simplify accessing JSON content via SQL, Oracle supports a simplified syntax for JSON access in addition to the SQL JSON operators. The simplified syntax allows you to navigate the JSON content by simply appending a JSON path expression to the name of a column. This basically means you can dot your way through your JSON in much the same way that you would navigate a JavaScript object. In this first example, I am selecting PO document, a column which contains JSON documents from a table called J purchase order. And I'm applying the predicate where j.podocument.po number equals 1600. What this means is that only documents that contain a top level key named PO number with a value of 1600 will be returned. And that's it. Using the simplified syntax, I can navigate my JSON documents without needing to use any of the SQL JSON operators. However, note that in order to use the simplified syntax, the following conditions must be met. First, the column must have and is JSON constraint applied to it. Second, an alias for the table must be specified in the from clause. And finally, the column must be qualified with the table alias. In the second example, I'm using the power of SQL's count and group by functionality to perform an aggregation over content that is part of my JSON documents. I am counting the number of JSON documents based on the value of the cost center key and ordering the result by the value of the cost center key. In the third example, I am using the simplified syntax to navigate through the nested hierarchy of objects in my JSON documents, looking for the value of the city key that is found within the address key of the shipping instructions object. Using JSON table, we can project content from any JSON document into a set of rows and columns. To be technically correct, JSON table produces an inline relational view of JSON content. JSON table is used in the from clause of a select statement. The JSON table operator consists of a set of JSON path expressions that define how to pivot content contained in the JSON document into a table with rows and columns. The first JSON path expression, known as a row pattern, determines the number of rows that will be output by a JSON table expression. The JSON path expression dollar refers to the entire document. The columns emitted by a JSON table operator are specified using the columns clause. The columns clause consists of a set of column definitions. Each column definition consists of a column name, a column data type, and a column pattern. The column pattern is a JSON path expression relative to the row pattern that determines which key will provide the value for the column. Nested arrays can be handled using one or more nested clauses. A nested clause consists of a secondary row pattern relative to the parent row pattern that references an array within the JSON document. When nested clauses are present, the number of rows emitted by JSON table expression will depend on the number of items in the deepest arrays processed by the JSON table operator. In this example, the top level row pattern is dollar, indicating that all JSON path expressions in the associated column clause, indicating that all JSON path expressions in the associated columns clause are relative to the top of the document. The line items key contains an array, and a nested clause is used to specify that the JSON table operator should emit one row for each member of this array. A second columns clause associated with a nested clause provides additional column definitions that map values from the members of the line items array into the columns output by the JSON table operator. We can also specify predicates based on the columns output by the JSON table operator. This allows all the features of SQL to be used to select rows based on the content of a JSON document. This example will output a row consisting of a column's PO number, reference, cost center, item number, and UPC code for each member of the line items array. It will output a set of rows for each document that meets the specified selection criteria. 
So if two documents match the predicate specified in the where clause, and the first document contains two line items, and the second document contains four line items, then six rows will be output in total. Technically speaking, the join between the rows generated by a nested clause and the row that contains the array that is the input to the nested clause is a right outer join, meaning that if no rows are output by the nested clause, the parent row is still emitted. As can be seen here, the output of the JSON table operation is a perfectly normal relational result set. In this example, it has produced an inline view containing six rows and five columns. The first two rows come from the first document, and the remaining four rows come from the second document. The beauty of this is that I can access all of my JSON content relationally. Any operation I can perform on relational data, I can perform on my JSON content once I have exposed it via JSON table. The real power of this is when it comes to dealing with legacy tools and programmers. Using JSON table, I can create a set of relational views that give tools, programs and programmers that only understand the relational metaphor access to my JSON content. JSON table in effect gives me schema on query semantics. So the application developers who are using schemaless development techniques to develop the applications that generate the data I'm reporting on are still free to change their data model at will. The worst case scenario is that I need to adjust my JSON table operators to expose new data that is now being captured by the application. The example on this page shows how we can leverage the power of SQL by applying SQL operators to the output of a JSON table operator. In this example, we are calculating the revenue for each purchase order and then listing them in descending order of revenue. The first step is to use JSON table to create an inline view of the documents. The row patterns result in a row being output for each member of the line items array. Each row consists of the columns PO number, quantity and unit price. SQL is used to obtain the total value of each member of the line items array by calculating quantity times unit price. The results are then grouped by PO number and the SQL sum operator is applied to the calculation to obtain the total revenue for each purchase order. Finally, the output is ordered by revenue descending. All of this has been done without performing any data migration or ETL operations on the JSON data. So you can see, by combining SODA and SQL JSON, Oracle is able to provide all the benefits of the NoSQL document store combined with all the benefits of a relational database. A really powerful combination. In order to ensure that SQL JSON queries perform well, Oracle provides a number of techniques that can be used to index JSON content. This gives us the flexibility to meet all the possible use cases for querying JSON. If you know you're going to query on a particular key, you can use the JSON value operator to create a functional index on that key. If you know you're going to perform a lot of JSON table-based operations on a particular set of row and column patterns, you can create a materialized view of that data using JSON table. This approach is particularly worthwhile if you find yourself providing a large number of relational views based on JSON table functionality, and the data that you are querying on is reasonably static. If you don't know what your JSON will look like and you cannot predict which keys will be used in the predicates, you can create a JSON search index. The JSON search index is a generalized inverted list index based on Oracle's text indexing capabilities. This allows you to index the entire document without having any predetermined knowledge of the structure of the documents being indexed. The JSON search index supports ad hoc path, value and keyword searches that use JSON path expressions as well as providing full text based searching on JSON content. It will be used to optimize any SQL operation that makes use of the SQL JSON operators, as well as query by example operations. This slide shows an example of creating the JSON search index over our JSON data. The JSON search index is based on Oracle's text te indexing technology, and we include a predefined section group that has been optimized for searching JSON content. The only decision you need to make is what your synchronization policy should be. And a lot of work has been done in Oracle Database 12C to ensure that sync on commit is a viable option when indexing JSON content. The query on this page shows the use of the operator JSON text contains to perform a full text search of JSON content. The explain plan shows that the JSON search index is being used to optimize the query. Similar plans will be observed if the query contained JSON value or JSON exist based predicates. And so to summarize. With Oracle Database 12C, we fully support the NoSQL style of application development. There is full support for the functionality provided by a typical NoSQL document store, full support for schemaless application development, allowing changes to be made to an application data model without needing to make any changes to the storage schema or take the application or database offline in order to deploy changes. When the application developers need to change the application, they are free to do so. There is a simple document-centric API that allows application developers to get up and running very quickly and there's no requirement to know or understand SQL in order to develop the application. However, Oracle Database 12C goes far beyond what is possible with the NoSQL style document store. We have SQL analytics and reporting on JSON content in place. There's no need to perform expensive ETL operations in order to query our JSON content. 
Oracle's JSON storage and query capabilities allow your JSON data to be tightly integrated with all the other kinds of data that your organization needs to manage, and we allow you to avoid unnecessary reliance on polyglot persistence and the complexity that that introduces. While it's undoubtedly true that some of the applications you are currently developing are going to use JSON-based persistence, a lot of your data is going to remain relational for the foreseeable future. Only Oracle could provide a platform that allows you to store, index, and query JSON data and relational data simultaneously. And only Oracle provides a consistent, standardized, and trusted solution for managing all of your data. So let's go over some of the key advantages of using Oracle Database 12C as a JSON document store from the application developer's perspective. First, JSON is stored natively in the Oracle database using existing SQL data types. There is no need to perform complex and expensive mapping between JSON and relational structures in order to store JSON content in the Oracle database. All existing database functionality works with JSON content. Developers can avoid reinventing the wheel for basic functionality like concurrency control, transactions and read consistency. Second, new document-centric APIs make it really easy to develop applications against the Oracle database. Developers do not need to learn SQL and will not need ongoing support from an Oracle database administrator in order to develop and deploy their applications. The Soda for REST API provides a set of RESTful document storage services that can easily be consumed from almost any development environment. And finally, all existing SQL APIs can work with JSON content stored in the Oracle database. Oracle provides full support for querying JSON documents using JSON path expressions. The full power of SQL is available for analytical and reporting operations on JSON content, giving you schema on query semantics. The relational schema is defined at query time by the SQL JSON operators and exists only for the duration of the query in the session executing this query. So it has no effect on the ability of the applications to store and retrieve any kind of JSON in the underlying tables. Oracle 12C also delivers powerful and flexible indexing operations that take full advantage of Oracle's 30 plus years of experience in how to efficiently index large volumes of data. All SQL JSON and JSON path expressions are automatically optimized to make use of the available indexing. Using SQL JSON operators, we can create relational views of JSON content that allow legacy applications, tools, and developers who do not understand JSON to access the content in our JSON documents. JSON operations are not restricted to JSON stored in the database. Using Oracle's external table mechanism, we can easily access JSON documents that are stored outside the database. As well as the new Soda family of APIs, or the traditional SQL-based APIs can be used to access and update JSON content and query JSON documents. Let's look at some of the advantages for the IT department. Firstly, IT can use a single infrastructure to manage all of their mission-critical data. This can lead to significant cost savings. Some people believe that the cost of ownership of a NoSQL database is significantly less than the cost of a relational database. This may be true in an either-or situation, but in the real world it never is. It's an always an and situation. And as far as I'm aware, the cost of A plus B is always greater than the cost of A on its own, and stating otherwise is a totally misleading statement. And such a statement can only be made by marketing people who don't understand the complexity of managing corporate data. Last time I checked, the majority of organizations already have a number of existing systems that use an Oracle database. So the cost associated with ownership of an Oracle database is not going to magically disappear overnight by adopting NoSQL for a new application. Also, there are some costs associated with owning a NoSQL database. We, we can debate whether or not it's truly less than the total cost of ownership for a relational database, but in the end it doesn't matter since the cost of owning a relational database plus the cost of owning a NoSQL database will always be greater than the cost of owning just Oracle. This is particularly true now that Oracle has introduced technologies like multi-tenant, which make the incremental cost of managing additional Oracle databases almost negligible. Also, remember that the TCO for Oracle allows you to manage relational data, JSON documents, XML documents, spatial documents, and textual information using one integrated data management platform and one single query language. SQL can be used to query all of your data, and you get the proven scalability, availability, reliability, security, and recoverability of the Oracle database. So there are lots of benefits and potential cost savings for IT by selecting the Oracle database as the platform for managing your JSON documents. The relational model is not going to disappear. How many times have we heard this over the last 30 years and it's still going strong? Other technologies have claimed to make it redundant. XML and objects are just two that come to mind. They have come and the Oracle database has simply absorbed the best features of them and become the best platform for managing those formats as well as managing relational data. And despite this, and despite all the claims that have been made for these post-relational storage models, the majority of the data that the Oracle database manages is still relational data. The Oracle database allows relational data, object data, semi-structured data, spatial data, and free text content to coexist. Oracle multi-tenant makes the Oracle database easy to deploy. 
Self-service applications are available that allow developers to request a new Oracle instance on demand without any intervention from a DBA. They simply press a button and a few minutes later they have a database instance they can play with, break, do whatever they want with. Multi-tenant really does enable highly scalable self-service database provisioning. And so in summary, the JSON developers are happy, they can have their NoSQL document store and all the benefits of schemaless development. They can have their simple APIs that they can use to develop and deploy and modify their applications all without requiring any support from the Oracle DBA. But all of this is done without sacrificing all the proven benefits of the Oracle database for reporting, analytics and data management. Thank you. I hope this presentation has been useful and I hope that you'll be able to take advantage of the new technology that we have presented to you today.